Hey, everybody. Welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. I'm Christy Brower, here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Katie <laughs> Weaver. Hey, Katie. Hello. How's it going? It's going good. Yeah. Excited to be back, uh, you know, behind the mic, doing what we do. Right? Doing what we do. Yeah. It is true, you know? I don't know about you, but it's, this has pretty much become a 24-7 thing for me. <laughs> I, me too. Yeah. And and when I have a little downtime, I'm like, ooh, what should I be researching? What should I be yeah. thinking about? What should Which I be documentary looking into? Do to watch? Yeah. I have I can't even tell you how many uh live stream or streaming channels I have bought on Amazon. Um because yeah. it has you know some documentary mm -hmm. I want to watch. Mm -hmm. it's terrible. I need to go look through my list and go, do I still need any of these? Yeah. Oh, that's how they get you. you they, yeah, it is. Although I will tell you that the Sundance channel rocks for all uh -huh. kinds of good, good stuff. One of my, yeah. one of my faves. There's a, well, there's a clue. A clue. Okay. Well, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that's for me too, is people are sending me stuff constantly, mm -hmm. you know, friends and listeners and, you know, people that I know that are like, Hey, did you look at this? Have you thought about this? Did you hear about that? And Yeah. But we've had a missing mm -hmm. kid from my town. Yes. This boy, this Curitan kid that, uh, so this boy, 18 years old, went from Rexburg to Spokane with some friends for the weekend, last weekend. And apparently when they were at Walmart or, or nearing Walmart, he had a fight with his friends and got out of the car and they left him. His wallet was in the car. He oh had gosh. no money, no ID, and his cell phone was broken. So he was stranded in another city many hours from home with nothing. Ooh. He called his parents frantically. They called the friends and made them go back. And they went back about an hour later and said they couldn't find him. And they just drove back to Rexburg and oh just God. stranded this kid. And then his parents went to Spokane and they couldn't find him. And they have looked and looked. The police have looked and looked. Uh, a coalition of parents from Washington who have missing children or have had missing children uh, were leading a search party and they found him today. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds like well, it. Where was he? I don't know. They just, this was like three hours ago. Yeah. They just said on Facebook, hey, he's been found. Thanks everybody for all of your help. Oh, and, well, I'm glad you know. he's been found. That is scary. Yeah. Well, one of his family members said there could be some mental health concerns here. I really wonder if uh, he was having a mental health episode when he had this incident with his friends, that that's what yeah. was actually happening. Yeah. And then he kind of, there's, it looked like there was a fair amount of homeless uh, in Spokane and in that area. Mm. Oh, there are and now. That he, that was my take was that he had kind of wandered off and was in a homeless encampment somewhere with other people and was maybe mm. not, uh, you know, fully cognizant. Yeah, yeah. not quite aware of mm -hmm. what was going on. Oh, yeah. I'm just but so they found him and... today. Thank God. How scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Holy cow. Anyway. Yikes. Well, anyway, yeah. this is my cold read for you. Yes. This week. So we are going to be talking about the Dardeen family homicides. Oh. So this is the Dardeen family. Darbeen, D-A-R? Dardeen. Dardeen, gotcha. Okay. Dardeen. We've got dad, Russell Keith Dardeen. He went by Keith. Okay. And then his wife, Elaine, and their little boy, Peter. Okay. And then um, at the time of the homicide, Elaine was pregnant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, they, Peter. Okay. Yeah. So they lived in Ina, Illinois. Okay. And they lived in uh, like a little trailer house that they were renting some property on. And Keith worked for some kind of water treatment facility in the area. Okay. And Elaine worked in an office supply store and they had their little boy, Peter. And they were, you know, the new baby was coming and they had decided that 
this little trailer that they were living in was not big enough when they had when they were going to have the baby. So their trailer sure. was for sale, and they were actually looking at moving back to where Keith was from, which was Mount Vernon. Okay. Um, he really didn't want to keep living in Ina, and I'll tell you why because in the two year in a two year period. There were 15 homicides in that in Jefferson County Holy around shit. Atlanta, Illinois. Yeah, it was crazy. Wow. For a while, they thought there was a serial killer in the area. It really kind of turned out that they were all not connected at all. Mm. But everybody was really on edge. Yeah. And people wouldn't even let strangers come in to use the phone. If you got sure. stranded on the road, you'd just walk home because you weren't knocking on anybody's door because you just didn't yeah. know. Like, for whatever reason, this area really went through a huge crime spree because it was small town, small populations, you know. Yeah. It would be like having 15 murders in two years here. Yeah. Which would be unthinkable, really. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't have that many here either. So that was kind of the, the, the vibe that was going out around in the area at the time. So... On the 18th of November in 1987, Keith did not show up for work. He was a really, really reliable worker. That never happened for him to just no show and, you know, not call right. or anything like this. And tell me the date happen. again. It was, um, let's see, sorry. What did they, oh, November 18th, 1987. 87. Okay. So he got, his boss got really concerned because he called his house mm -hmm. several times, no answer. So he actually called Keith's parents. They must have been his emergency contacts. Wow. And they, um, they were divorced, but they lived near each other in Mount Carmel. Okay. And neither one of them knew what was going on either. So uh, Don, Keith's dad, called the county sheriff's office and said and said that he would drive to the house in Ina with the key because he had a spare key mm -hmm. and meet a deputy there to see what was going on. Because by this point, this is in the evening. No one has heard from this family for mm -hmm. like more than 24 hours now. Basically, yeah. people are getting freaked out. Yeah. So. Let's see. Um, so they lived near uh, the Illinois Central Railroad tracks, and they also lived near Illinois Route 37. So they were kind of there near railroad tracks and a, and a highway. Sure. And so there were a lot of people that kind of went by there. When the police get there and they meet Don Dardine, mm -hmm. he opens the door. And they go inside and they find an absolutely unbelievably horrific scene. Oh. Elaine and Peter have both been bound and gagged. And they've been beaten to death with a baseball bat. Oh my God. During the this part's awful, mm -hmm. you guys, and I'm not I'm not gonna get too graphic. During the uh, attack, Elaine went into labor and gave birth to their baby girl. Oh, my God. Who also did not survive. Yeah. So, creepily enough, Elaine and Peter and the baby were all laying next to each other in a bed. So they'd been placed in the bed, and the house had kind of been cleaned up. Weird. No sign of Keith. Hmm. So, at first, investigators thought he'd killed his wife and children and that he was on the lam. He drove a red 1981 Plymouth. I was thinking about a 1981, a red 1981 Plymouth. We had something about that same age when we were little kids at Plymouth yes, Station Wagon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So anyway, they go looking for him because they're thinking, oh, crap, you know, he's killed them. And his dad was like, no, absolutely not. I know my son. There is no way in hell he killed them. Yeah. 
So late the next day, some hunters find Keith's body in a wheat field not very far from the trailer. And he had been shot three times and his penis was cut off. Oh my God. I mean, it's just so weird and random. So then they find his car and it is parked outside of a police station in Benton, Illinois. Okay. Which is about 11 miles away from the home. And the in inside of the car splattered with blood. Sure. So they're pretty sure he was actually killed in the car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, everybody freaks out. Um, because, the, you know, this insane murder, um, I don't want to say spree because it wasn't the same killer. But this, you know, spate of violent crime is happening in their area. And they're like, what the hell? So... Uh, local police called in the Illinois State Police to investigate the crime. And at one point, they had about 30 detectives working on it, and they interviewed around 100 people. Sure. And they found nothing. Mm -hmm. They didn't find anybody that saw anything. They talked to a coworker of Keith's that he'd not been getting along with very well. That guy was cleared. Mm -hmm. Nobody had anything bad to say about Keith and Neely. They were just nice people living their yeah. lives. They they played in a in a played and sang in a band at their church. Oh. And you know, just like you know, yeah. he there just wasn't nobody said anything bad about him. Right. They found some marijuana in the trailer. And they were surprised by that because n neither Keith nor Elaine actually tested positive for marijuana. And they thought I was that say, actually, I don't think it was theirs. Yeah. 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 That's that's what the police thought, too, that it was actually left behind by the killer because they yeah. didn't have any alcohol or drugs in their systems. Mm -hmm. So the coroner decided that the time of death for Elaine and Peter and the baby was only about an hour different from Keith's time of death. Mm -hmm. So this was weird. Like, why was Keith in the car? Like, what was going on? So they, they figured that um, the bodies in the trailer, they'd been dead for about 12 hours. Uh -huh. When they found Keith, he'd been dead 12 to 36 hours. So they really were confused about why he was farther away from the family. And, you know, the, the, the other thing that they noticed is that you know, whoever killed them really took their time at the trailer. Like they put mm -hmm. them in bed and cleaned up. So it didn't that, seem like they were worried. Answer something for me, though, because mm. I really felt like I actually think that Keith died first. I think Keith died first and then they went back to the trailer for the rest of them. Because mm -hmm. it did seem like they knew he wasn't going to come home. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they, they thought, well, geez, you know, maybe it was just a stranger on Route 37 on the highway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they also had questions about, was it only one person or was it more than one person, you know? Mm -hmm. It was multiple people. It was two people, maybe okay. three, but two, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they worked a lot at trying to figure out a motive and they could not come up with anything. There were valuables in the house that were not taken. Mm -hmm. They didn't take anything at all. Uh, they also, I don't know how they can determine that Elaine was not sexually assaulted if she also spontaneously gave birth, but they did say right. that. I am not so sure. I don't know how they could know that. Yeah. Um, you know, they looked for things like, was one of them having an affair or, you know, there were um, some papers in the house that indicated that Keith might have been gambling on sports. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, Keith's mom was like, no way in hell. He was so frugal. Mm -hmm. He was collecting and selling cans to save up for his son's college fund. That's how frugal this dude was. So they're like, no, there wasn't anything like that. No, I don't think so. He was. As well, he was also super straight laced, you know. Oh yeah, he he was very. Uh, you follow the rules. You do what you're told. You know, this mm -hmm. that was the kind of person he was. 
It, it was, yeah. So it just didn't seem like there was anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the police really didn't think that this was just random. Um, it seemed like it was personal. But then a lot of crazy stuff got going on because um, there was there was, you know, this was during that time when everything was Satanists. Oh, Do you remember that? Yeah. Like in the eighties, like everything was Satanist. So there was a, there was a, a satanic cult in the area, and that's who done it. That was going around a lot because um, they'd mutilated his body, and you know, mm-hmm. I don't know that none of that actually really panned out at all. Yeah. Um, they wondered if it was a case of mistaken identity that they went to the wrong house because they just, I mean, literally they are just grasping at straws. Yeah. And so the FBI came in after a while because the police were just like, look, we've looked at everything. We have no freaking clue, nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at this point, the police kind of have to move on to other cases. Well, um, Joanne Dardine, who is Keith's mom, mm-hmm. has worked really hard to try to keep this case still alive, you know, sure. try to keep people, you know, interested. One of the things she did is she got thir- she got 3,000 signatures from residents in the area to petition the Oprah Winfrey show to cover this case. And they said no, because it was too graphic for daytime oh. TV. So they wouldn't do it. Um, uh, America's Most Wanted also said the same thing. But eventually they did run a segment on this case in 1998. But Mm -hmm. it didn't generate any leads. Yeah. The the problem here is nobody saw anything. Yeah. So there were a couple of different serial killers that had potential. And there's one I really want to ask you about. But one that they that they did rule out. Um, his name was, um, he went by Rafael Resendez Ramirez and he um, was arrested in Texas in 1999. He traveled around the country hopping freight trains mm-hmm. and chose his victims near train tracks and he did beat his victims to death. Mm-hmm. Um, so they did suspect him, but they never were able to actually connect him to the crime. They just... It seemed like what he could have done, but they didn't have any evidence that could connect him to something. So then another serial killer, also in Texas, weirdly, was uh, Tommy Lynn Sells. So in 1999, he cut the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas, and one of them lived and helped identify him. He was convicted and sentenced to death for that murder. Mm-hmm. And then while he was, uh, well, while he was awaiting trial on this murder charge, he just starts confessing to all kinds of murders oh. because he was also drifting around on freight trains. Mm-hmm. And one, he actually confessed to 70 murders. They confirmed 22 of them. Mm-hmm. He was con- he was uh, executed in 2014, but one of the cases that he said that he did was the Dardine family. Mm-hmm. He said he didn't remember the details of all the crimes that he committed, and you know he he was one of those serial killers who was trying to get a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, but he did you know he had been in the area in the mid 80s, mm-hmm. riding the trains. And um, he worked. He also worked carnivals and fairs, and was a day laborer, mm-hmm. and hitched rides with truckers and stuff. So he was just kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. And you know, he said that um, he met. Well, this is what. He, so he told like three different versions of the story. He says he met Keith at a truck stop near Mount Vernon. Um, or you met him at a local pool hall. There's a couple of different versions. And he said that Keith invited him home for dinner. Um, he also said that after the meal, he was just going to leave. But then Keith um, asked him if he wanted to have a threesome with him and Elaine. And that triggered him oh. from his sexual abuse as a child. And he freaked out and killed them all. Oh, my um, God. And that he, you know. Oh, that that was not Keith and Elaine. No, no, it wasn't at all. 
But and also Elaine was largely pregnant. Right. Yes. She was now, not in threesomes. Right. No. But Sells was kind of known for that, like stuff that he actually did do. He mm -hmm. would blow it way out of proportion, um, so that he could give like an excuse for why he did what he did. Sure. And so investigators were kind of like, eh, we've heard this stuff from him before. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, the third version sounds a little more interesting. So they had that trailer for sale. Yeah. And he uh, got off a freight train near Ina, he says, and he saw the for sale sign. And he thought, oh, that's a way to get in the door. He's going to go knock on the door and say, I'm, I'm interested in your trailer. Mm -hmm. So he says they let him in. And um, Keith was kind of wary of him and not so sure. But he said he was interested in buying the trailer. And then he says he overpowered Keith and made him bind and gag his wife and son with duct tape. And then he forced him to drive to the nearby field at gunpoint. He said, I don't know. He said that he sliced Keith's penis off then, telling me he was going to take it to Elaine. But then he shot him and, and left it there. And then he went back to the trailer, raped Elaine and beat Peter. And then, you know, the whole, and then beat them all to death. So that story is kind of what got uh, the families and the investigators going, maybe. You know, they weren't sure that they could trust this guy. I'm going to put up a picture of cells so you can see him. They weren't so sure they could trust this guy, but he was kind of sometimes telling a story that might have been true. Right. And they did not want to discount anything. Just in case. You know? sure, of course not. Right. Because, hell, they had nothing. Right. Nothing. So they wanted to, the, the investigators in Illinois wanted to go get him in Texas and bring him to Ina and see if he could kind of show them like, where was the trailer? Where did he kill Keith? Mm -hmm. See if, you know, he could kind of back up some of the stuff sure. he's been saying. Well, Texas wouldn't let him do it. <sighs> Texas said uh, it's against state law to let a, um, a, an inmate on death row leave the state. And so they would not let him oh, go. God. And so, although they really did suspect him, mm -hmm. they never really got a full story out of him. They never really got to fully talk to him. Yeah. I mean, they did, I mean, they kind of did talk to him, but they never really got to do what they needed to do to right. um, for anything. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was no physical evidence of him there, but I don't think there was much physical evidence of anybody there. That was the problem. Yeah. Um, he didn't necessarily know all of the details of the crime that had not been released. Mm -hmm. But you also have to remember that this happened in the 80s. And this is in about 2010 when he was telling this story. So yeah. it had been quite a while. So Joanne Dardine, um, Keith's mom... So the confession, that confession was first reported in 2000. And then mm -hmm. it kind of carried on for clear until he was um, executed in 2014. Yeah. At first, she was absolutely certain that it was him. And she, um, she really didn't want him to be uh, executed because she was afraid that they were going to execute him and then they'd yeah. never know the answer. Yeah. Um, and his execution actually did have a stay in 2010 because there were some questions about his mental health status. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, duh. Um, but she never was quite sure. She actually wanted to go and talk to him herself. Uh -huh. and, and he wouldn't let her. Man, what a badass. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That she was able to want to go do that. She was like, yeah. I want to hear the whole story. I want him to say it to my face. Mm-hmm. That never happened. He never allowed it. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, he was executed. I don't so, think it was him. Okay. 
So yeah, I, I want to take a little break. And when we come back, I want you to talk to us about Keith's or about, um, sorry, not Keith, Tommy Lynn sells. Mm -hmm. If you think it was him, if you don't think it was him, who do you think committed this crime? Because it, I mean, it was like a ghost came in there and did this. Like they had nothing then, they have nothing now. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, Tommy Lynn sells is dead and he was their best option. So yeah. anyway, let's take a little break. And when we come back, let's hear your psychic analysis. Okay. And we are back and we're talking about the Dardeen family homicides. And we're asking Katie, this is a cold read show for Katie. And the, the big question is, did Tommy Lynn Sells murder the Dardeen family as he said he did? No. Okay. I don't. It's interesting because a couple of things clicked for me too, mm -hmm. because I did feel like whoever killed this family did not come by vehicle they came on foot mm -hmm. uh, there was no car that you know they showed up in but I I see two people and I don't think I don't believe it was him I, mm -hmm. I do believe like you know this idea that somebody rolled the rails through town or something almost mm -hmm. clicks for me except for that I think this was actually hitchhiking oh but, okay well they live near the highway too and so mm -hmm. that was one of the the challenges the police had was Mm -hmm. They live by the rail tracks, they live by the highway. Anybody could have rolled through here, you know? Yeah. But what I'm seeing is a couple, a, a man and a woman. Okay. I feel like they were drugged out of their freaking minds. This looks to me like some serious hardcore drug use going on. Okay. I feel like they saw these guys getting out of their car and going in the house. And it seemed like, or, or they saw them outside. I mean, they saw them. And mm -hmm. that uh, I, I do feel like they were trying to get money out of them initially. That was mm -hmm. their thought. But they really okay. didn't have much to offer. Right. And I do feel like Keith fought back and tried. Mm -hmm. I feel like the man took Keith in the car and left and told the woman to take care of them. Mm. mom and son Oof. and I don't know that he actually indicated for her to actually kill them but I feel like she was went really crazy I think she was really really crazy on I, I just keep seeing that they were on like some kind of bad cocktail of drugs that they were like larger than life mm -hmm. really really dangerous really uh, out of their minds unhinged yeah I feel like he drove Keith away trying to basically tell him that, uh, you know, we're going to hurt your family if you don't come up with some money for us, if you don't, mm -hmm. you know, do something for us. And he basically, he had a little money in the bank. He didn't have a lot to offer. He didn't have much in the house. Like, what did they think they were going to get from a family that lived in a freaking trailer house? I, I don't know. know. Yeah. But there was, this was not rational thought. I mean, you can't apply rational thought to irrational situations and, right. you know, but uh, I feel like he's the one that took him out. I feel like he did shoot him in the car one time and then got him out into that field and then threatened him and kind of gave him one last chance to, you know, cough up some money or give me some idea of where I can get some money. No. And so cutting off his penis was just a, like machoistic, you know, thing to do. Mm -hmm. I totally disagree with the police that they knew these people. They did not know these people. They yeah, didn't know I, them at all. I didn't think so either. And so then I, I feel like he either. drove the car back to Keith's house and his girlfriend is inside and has beat these two to death with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. And she's the one that wanted to lay them on the bed. I don't think she expected the birth of the baby to happen. 
I do, I had the weirdest, yuckiest uh, vision of her holding the baby Ooh. and trying to, you know, like cradling the baby and almost like kind of saying, well, we should just, we should, maybe we should take the baby and the baby was dead. But like, this is really sick stuff. If you can, you know, join me in a place of, you know, people being very depraved and out of their minds, that's where this was. Yeah. But um, she's the one that insisted that they lay them on the bed all together. Mm -hmm. And and did clean up some of the blood because she got paranoid. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, they did, uh, I think, do a pretty good job of getting rid of their evidence. Interesting that they left some weed behind. But I feel like as far as their... Uh, and this is in 87. I mean, the, yeah. these older cases, forensics, just, started forensics just wasn't there yet, you know? Yeah. And then they just drove the town, the car into that town and just parked it and got out and walked down the sidewalk and off mm -hmm. they went. Weirdly, they left. So they left that car in front of the police station in Benton, which is about 11 miles away from Ina. Mm -hmm. so I don't think they, that they meant to leave it at a, like by the police station. I, I think okay, that I just that. so happened. They just thought we're just going to drive into town and then get out of it and ditch it and, you know, mm -hmm. and go on. I feel like they they went directly on into uh you know moving on into another town like they didn't stay around at all yeah i don't think they were from the area i do think that they committed other crimes for money for drugs down the road or along their way i don't think they committed another like mass murder like this mm -hmm. but this was a bad cocktail of drugs that they were on together mm -hmm. and kind of like it's, I don't want to sound cliche, but it kind of feels Bonnie and Clyde-ish in that they were showing off for each other, you mm -hmm. know, and really uh, kind of. Kind of a helter-skelter kind of deal. Yeah, matching each other's depravity, you know. So, of course, they never found him. I mean, they just, uh, they were a ghost because they showed up by, on foot. No one really knew them, saw them. Like it all just went down. No, yeah. like it did. There was no one to witness this, you know. Right. No, there, there wasn't. That was extremely sad. But the thing that just really rocks my stomach is this vision of her with that baby. Oh, yeah. 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 It's no. really, really disturbing and haunting. Yeah. But that's what I believe happened. Um, I think that these two were traveling, you know, like, mm -hmm. like cross country. Yeah. And. But without much of a, you know, kind of rebels without a clue kind of a situation, mm -hmm. they didn't really have a goal in mind. Mm -hmm. I think they were just leaving one stupid situation and heading into another one, you know. True. But uh, I hope they get caught. I hope at some point somebody says something. If they're still living, I kind of suspect that they're not. They were on a very bad track. Yeah. And so I, I don't, I'm never going to say that it won't get solved because I don't want to take that away from anybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, it would have to be a, some kind of a confession that uh, yeah, blew people out of At this out point, I mean, there's, yeah. there's nothing left evidence-wise, so it would be... Yeah. Well, there wasn't much, so... And, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe they'll confess because they actually did it, you know? Yeah. I don't know what it is about Texas serial killers that like to confess to crimes they did not commit, but that, is a, that has been a common oh, yeah. thing. Well, okay, with the... the what was his name? Tommy Lynn Sells. Yeah. He was smart. He was super smart. And I feel like he followed the news pretty well. Mm -hmm. And he knew all about this case because he'd read about it. He'd heard about it on TV. And, you know, I also feel like he was one that would kind of compare other criminals' work to his own. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the cases that he did commit himself to that he actually didn't do uh, he had learned about them because he was interested in crime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of um, um, do things like this because then it opens new investigations and it keeps them from being executed. Yes. But it didn't yeah. really work in this case because they just never really believed him and they couldn't really connect him to that crime. Like there was no actual evidence. No. Well, and he couldn't give them anything other than what the news had reported. Right. And that he was one of the problems. Any extra details that he could throw in there that they would go, oh, so yeah. you were at the crime scene or you couldn't have known, blah, blah, blah. Because he wasn't. Yeah, yeah they'd held anything. some stuff back. Yeah. And he didn't know any of it. And mm -hmm. so that really made him wonder. But then they're like, but geez, you know, mm -hmm. why would you commit, you know, why would you uh, 
admit to this, but yeah. you know, yeah. serial killers be crazy as we right. know. Most definitely. Well, what a horrifying case and, you know, so much love to their families, particularly, you know, to Keith's mom, who's worked so hard to keep this case in some yeah. kind of spotlight. I mean, of course, I'm sure she desperately would love to know but there was yeah. some kind of justice out there for the people who did this to her family. By the time Tommy Lynn Sells was executed, she had decided that it probably really was not him. Mm -hmm. She, yeah. you know, over the years, she kind of, she at first was like, yeah, definitely it's him. I'm sure she was, as a rational adult, would be like, why would he say he did it if he didn't do it, yeah. you know? But over the years, his behavior and his refusal to meet with her and changing yeah. the story you know she finally did kind of come to terms with he didn't do it yeah that's so cruel what a it, it's so cruel so cruel i cannot imagine mm -hmm. you know wanting to do that to people but you know he was a serial killer yeah i was I gonna mean, say i mean we are talking about a serial killer here he killed 22 people i mean they, yeah. they have you know linked him to 22. yeah and he's one of those guys that probably now with familial DNA, he'll probably, you know, his body count will probably go up a lot of them, a lot of them will. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Well, thank you for that read. That is the Dardine yeah. family homicide. So it is Tuesday Yeah. and we have a lot more coming. We have tomorrow is May 5th, which is actually national missing and murdered indigenous women day. So yeah. we have a very special show for you about that. And then, of course, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mountain, we will have our live case update, our live stream. And on Thursday, we will have our live stream for the Psychic Hour also at 7 p.m. Mountain. So lots more good things to come. Plus, who knows? You know, I mean, I did do an update on Lorena and John Bobbitt as a... Uh, as a uh, pop-up last weekend, maybe we'll come up with something else. I thought that one was a pretty good one. So. <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely stay with us. Um, if you want to send us a case, go to truecrimeparanormalpodcast.com and uh, scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll find a little form you can fill out to send us a case. Yeah. Um, be sure to find us on Facebook. We have a fan page yeah. and a linked discussion group where we talk about these cases and uh, it's true crime paranormal pod. It's true crime paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, the fan pages, and then it's true crime paranormal podcast discussion group. Yeah, uh, that is linked to it. So be sure that you come and connect with us. Yes, we love to hear from you guys. We love to hear your ideas. We love to hear what cases you want to hear us do. So definitely come and connect with us. You know, we we have a little community over there, and sometimes yeah. we like to joke about how weird we all are for love and true crime, but that's all right. Cause if that's you, you <laughs> we'll just be in. weird together. Yeah. We'll just be weird together. Now, another thing is every once in a while, somebody says, I didn't know that. Not only are we on YouTube or on all podcast platforms, but we are on both YouTube and all that podcast platforms. So if you watch us on YouTube yeah. and you would like to listen to us on a podcast, please go find us on mm -hmm. all of your favorite podcast platforms. We are there. If you listen to us on your podcast and you would like to see us or attend yeah. one of our live streams, come find us at on YouTube or True Crime Paranormal on YouTube. Mm -hmm. We always appreciate the likes, the comments, the subscribes, the shares. We are growing like crazy, guys. We are going to hit 100,000 downloads by the 1st of June. Yeah. So, dude, we'll take it pretty excited yep very excited yeah so make sure you connect with us in whatever way you can yeah yeah well you guys know it we are true crime paranormal with the psychic sisters have a great day take care <laughs>